what do we learn by looking at 600 million years of animal history? Evolution's tinkering with mammalness to make whales. In the same way, it's tinkering with fishiness to make tetrapods. And it's tinkering with animalness to make all the different body plans that we see. All these different creatures are variations of the same theme, restated over and over again. The question was, what was evolution tinkering with? One of the remarkable discoveries of the last 20 years is that evolution is not tinkering with the bodies. It's tinkering with the recipe, the machinery that builds bodies. What is that recipe? What is that machinery? It's the genes. Fossils record the changes in animals' bodies over time. But just how bodies change was unknown. The search for the genetic mechanism of evolution took most of the century. When scientists finally found it, they were astonished by just how simple it was. One of the key players was Mike Levine. I was, um, I guess, kind of a weird kid. I always liked bugs. We had a nice big backyard, and I could go back there. It was kind of a sanctuary, and uh, I played with bugs, dissected them, manipulated them. That's really the most pleasant memory I have. Levine's affinity for bugs led to his study of biology. One insect in particular became an object of fascination. They have a quick generation time, and they have lots of pattern. I mean, you wouldn't know it if you look at a distance, but when you look under a, a microscope at an adult fruit fly, you'd be astounded by the, the number of bristles, the intricacies of their wings, the, the, the patterns of their eyes. But the embryos are something else. I do love the embryos. Scientists had long suspected that embryos held clues to how animals evolve. All embryos start out as clusters of nearly identical cells. But soon, an embryo partitions itself into specialized segments, which develop into the final form of the animal. What controlled this process? How did the embryos know what shape to take? One of the first people to study these questions was a 19th century naturalist named William Bateson. Bateson wrote that animal skeletons revealed an underlying structure of repeating segments. He also observed that animals occasionally developed with some segments in the wrong places. Insects with legs in the wrong place, crabs where a claw was transformed into a leg, pythons with extra ribs or frogs with extra cervical vertebrae and all these sorts of things. To Bateson, these developmental errors meant that the underlying blueprint for the animal was being disrupted. He had no idea how it happened, but he suspected that these random changes might provide the fuel for evolution. By the 1940s, scientists working with fruit flies had learned how to cause disruptions in the developmental blueprint by dousing growing embryos with radiation and poison. And so when they did that, they found flies with changed wing structures, changed legs, and these very special flies that have one part of the body in the wrong place, or a copy of a normal part of the body in another place. The scientists had triggered the changes by damaging the fly's DNA. Within each cell of the developing embryo is a chain-like molecule called DNA. The experiments showed that DNA was somehow causing the embryo to divide into segments. 
But how? Scientists were just beginning to grasp that the DNA itself was made up of segments, called genes. The question was, how did the genes shape the body? One researcher, Dr. Ed Lewis of Caltech, studied this question for 30 years by crossbreeding thousands of flies. Lewis's work led him to a controversial idea. He proposed that a surprisingly simple mechanism was shaping embryos. He wrote that each segment of the fly was being directed to grow by a single gene. A small set of genes, a kind of genetic toolkit, appeared to be laying out the entire body. And as you looked at these genes, you said, this one affects this part of the body, this affects the next part of the body, and this affects the next part of the body. That was an astonishing observation. It was astonishing because it seemed too simple. Nobody else thought single genes were powerful enough to control something as complex as the structure of the body. Skeptics argued that Lewis's idea was guesswork. Of course, he had never seen the genes, because the techniques to do so didn't exist. From the 1920s to the 1970s, it was not possible to physically isolate any specific gene. That opportunity first became available, fortunately for me, at the time that I was a student. And so many of us thought, wow, we can finally dig in there and identify these really mysterious genes. Levine enlisted his friend and fellow scientist, Bill McGuinness. The first gene they went after had an unusual name, Antennapedia, which means antenna leg. The gene was thought to control the growth of legs. When the gene misfired, flies grew legs in the wrong place, on their heads in place of antennae. In normal flies, legs grow from the midsection, the area called the thorax. So Levine and McGuinness decided to hunt for the gene in the thorax of a normal embryo. The expectation is that antennapedia would be active, expressed in the thorax, the developing thorax of the embryo. But who knew? Levine and McGuinness had to do something no one had ever done before. They had to find a way to see a gene in action. We wanted to light up the gene. And it was very painstaking work. The project called for new and untested methods. At first, it didn't work very well, and there were a number of technical uh, problems to solve. The team had to find a delicate balance of radioactive probes and toxic enzymes. Too much of either would destroy the embryos. The process was not very gratifying on a day-by-day -day basis. Unbelievably tedious. It took months of trial and error. People often said, you know, you should try something else. You know, this is too long shot. You know, you're, gonna, you're just wasting your time. Uh, but we kept going. Finally, late one night, all the work paid off. And there was this moment when we saw that the gene was turned on in a band in the middle of a very early embryo. This had never been seen before. The antennapedia gene was acting like a master switch, turning on the segment of the embryo that would become the thorax. The implications were mind-boggling. 
If single genes like Antennapedia could define whole segments of an animal, these genes were acting like architects of the body. And if one of these genes turned on in the wrong place, striking changes to the body could result. It seemed that Lavina McGuinness had uncovered the genes responsible for the evolution of bodies. But there were still doubts. The work had all been done in fruit flies. What about other animals? Did they use the same mechanism to build their bodies? An answer would come from Switzerland. In 1994, Walter Gehring of the University of Basel isolated the gene that triggered the growth of eyes in fruit flies. The gene was called eyeless, because flies without it developed with no eyes. Gehring knew of a gene in mice that worked in the same way. He wondered, were the two genes the same? And this question we tested by taking the mouse gene and putting it into fruit flies to see whether flies can understand the message of the mouse. Gehring replaced a fly's gene for eyes with the mouse gene. And to everybody's surprise, the mouse gene works perfectly well and can induce a compound eye in the fruit fly. The fruit fly grew normal fruit fly eyes using a gene from a mouse. Not only did the two creatures use the same mechanism, they used the same gene. This was the mechanism behind extra wings, legs sprouting from heads, and Bateson's deformed animals. The century-long search was complete. The genetic engine of the body's evolution turned out to be a tiny handful of powerful genes. So what this means is, is in some ways, some sense, evolution is a simpler process than we first thought. When you think about all of the diversity of forms out there, we first believed that this would involve all sorts of novel creations, starting from scratch, again and again and again. We now understand that no, that, that evolution works with uh, packets of information and uses them in new and different ways and new and different combinations without necessarily having to invent anything fundamentally new but new combinations. Suddenly, the commonality of form among animals was understood. Animals resembled each other because they all used the same set of genes to build their bodies. A set of genes inherited from a common ancestor that lived long ago. And what we see now among all the animals are just variations on a body plan that existed half a billion years ago.